Okay, um, thank you uh, for coming to my lecture. It's my pleasure to deliver the second topic uh, for uh, the lecture today. And um, I've been told that uh, you have to be divided into parts because of uh, social distancing in order not to overcrowd the, uh, the room because of a pandemic. But uh, I know that the lecture is recorded, so you can also see the first part of the lecture at convenient uh, time. So uh, now I would like to convey some information about imaging diagnostics of temporomandibular joints. And just as I said during the first part of, a, of my lecture, uh, since uh, there is no uh, uniform uh, method of uh, diagnosing uh, something that would be universal, we use different imaging methods. And uh, here I used uh, the, these circles uh, to mention <clears throat> the importance of different imaging methods um, in temporomandibular joints. Uh, so the circles in blue are the ones which are methods based on uh, x-rays, uh, so uh, potentially harmful to human beings, and the ones marked with uh, pink color are the ones that demonstrate mostly soft tissues. And, for example, medical CT is depicted at the same time with blue and pink because it allows simultaneous evaluation of tissue. And the circle for MRI is the biggest. The contents of temporomandibular joint is joint is best imaged by means of MRI, and we use it especially in cases of dislocation of a temporomandibular joint disc. Uh, TMJ is so very uh, difficult for imaging diagnostics because uh, it lies on the conjunction of the skull and the temporal bone and maxillofacial area represented by the mandible. Uh, so within this tiny space, there are numerous lesions that can arise both from the side of temporal bone, benign lesions and malignant tumors, or from the side of mandibular condyle, uh, different tumors, benign, malignant, and also uh, lesions affecting uh, bone But also, because of a joint space, uh, we've got uh, benign lesions such as synovial cyst or chondroblastoma, a malignant tumor such as synovial sarcoma and synovial proliferative diseases such as synovial or pigmented villonodular synovitis. So they are related to the tissues located in the joint uh, itself, so the synovial membrane and also cartilage uh, from the um, embryological development of a tumor. So let's have a look at the possibilities of imaging of temporomandibular joints. Um, I will use an old, uh, old position paper. It was published back in uh, oops, um, it was published back in 1997. So this was in fact the time May 1997 when I was completing my medical studies and I started work in radiology in October 97. So the American Academy of uh, Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology uh, published a position paper that compared different uh, imaging techniques for temporomandibular joint examination. And since then, there is no update of this publication, so I will still base on the same one. Um, as you can see very clearly in the table, the radiographs such as panoramic are transcranial, so uh, the Schiller's view and uh, other skull views have very limited um, uh, use in case of TMJ uh, 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 diseases. And so many of these x-rays are no longer used. What is used heavily, it's panoramic radiographs, but you are probably aware that panoramic radiography is very prone to technical errors, and depending on patient positioning, uh, also the image of TMJ may uh, vary 
uh, considerably. One of uh, common artifacts in um, imaging of uh, <coughs> temporomandibular condyles with panoramic uh, um, uh, radiography are the so-called pseudocysts. I mark them with blue arrows, and they are not real cysts. They are just concavities on the surface of the head of a condyle, which in panoramic uh, radiography may look like a cyst because they uh, possess a definite, uh, well-limited uh, sclerotic border, and this is just the margin of this indentation. Also, um, owing to patient positioning in panoramic radiography, um, the TMJ joints may not be fully visible, in the radiograph, if a patient's face, skull is very big and does not fit in the uh, chosen field of view. In this case, um, uh, the TMJs are not visible at all. And this is um, because in this uh, panoramic machine, um, the, the exposure parameters and the size of the imaged area uh, is uh, chosen on the basis of patient's gender and um, introduced input uh, date of birth. So you can see it's a child, but it was a big child. So the device thought it was just a child and used a small field of view, while genetically, let's say biologically, the boy was big, so uh, the bigger field of view should have been used and the TMJs were completely cropped from the picture. Um, panoramic radiography, uh, is not reproducible. Uh, these are two panoramic radiographs of the same patient uh, taken in my department with the same panoramic machine. I couldn't confirm whether it was the same radiographer or a different, but still, uh, same patient, same machine, and we've got uh, a lot of uh, technique variations between the two scans. And um, for example, the chin. In um, the first radiograph, the chin more, was more down than the, in the other one, and then it affects the image also of the condyles of TMJ. So panoramic radiograph is not the best imaging modality for uh, <clears throat> visualization of TMJs. Um, what is a better solution if you go for conventional radiography? It's tomographic x-rays of TMJ that can be done in some panoramic machines. Uh, and it's done with uh, mouth closed and mouth open. And uh, you get four images of TMJ in one, let's say, film, in one digital picture. Uh, two of them are of right TMJ, two of them are of left TMJ. Uh, these ones are closed mouth position and uh, the, the ones inside uh, the radiograph are in open mouth position. And we can do them also uh, with a splint in therapeutic position to check whether the splint really affects the position of the condyles. And um, Let's have a look at comparison of panoramic radiographs and um, tomographic images of TMJs. Uh, one more important thing is that uh, panoramic radiography is obtained with a bite pack in uh, dentate patients in order to separate the image of upper and lower teeth in one panoramic radiograph. Uh, but for TMJ, this position is not neutral. It's neither a closed mouth nor open mouth position. And even if you have asymmetry in position of TMJ condyles in, panoramics, uh, in panoramic radiographs, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be asymmetry in open mouth position. So you can see that panoramics are not reliable. Um, this is a patient uh, who reported uh, chronic recurrent luxation of TMJ. Uh, she had like hypermobility, has um, hypermobility of uh, different joints in her body. 
and the condyles uh, are in glenoid fossa, but uh, with mouth open. Uh, you can see with open mouth position, which is uh, in this side, uh, sideways, uh, that the condyles are far beyond uh, the articular eminence, which testifies to uh, um, recurrent luxation. And um, this is a table derived from the textbook um, Temporal Mandibular Joint Imaging from a chapter um, written by two distinguished colleagues, um, Keith Horner and David McDonald, who uh, did a lot of work on uh, conventional imaging of TMJ. And um, they, uh, in the table, they summarized uh, the use of x-rays for uh, different TMJ or uh, conventional radiography is not useful at all, for example, in myofascial pain or in suspected uh, disc displacements. And in many cases, uh, you will find information that panoramic radiography is just a good starting point, but in most of the cases, it will need further imaging diagnostics such as medical CT or CBCT and or uh, MRI, especially in trauma, tumors, and inflammations. Let's have a look at some examples of uh, use of radiography in TMJ diagnosis. This is congenital uh, disease, pycnodisostosis, and uh, there is bilateral hypoplasia of uh, condyles with very, in fact, also not only of condyles, but the remi of a mandible with uh, very deep sigmoidal notches and very long and narrow coronoid and uh, condylar uh, processes. In unilateral uh, condylar hyperplasia, one condyle is larger than usual. Also, the ramus of the mandible may be bigger and the uh, mandibular body and the midline in the maxilla and mandible may not um, be matched. Uh, for uh, the same patients, we've got a uh, lateral cephalometric radiograph, and uh, you can see very clearly that the right and left uh, angles of a mandible do not overlap, which is one more um, effect testifying to asymmetry of uh, the mandible on the right and the left side. This is an older picture because bifid condyle uh, does not occur so very often. Uh, this is a division of a condyle creating, let's say, two separate uh, condylar heads. And uh, in literature, you can find sporadic cases of trifid condyle, so of like three separate small uh, condylar uh, heads. Um, osteoarthritis, which is now treated as uh, low-grade inflammation, of uh, joints uh, can affect TMJ. In early diseases, um, conventional radiography might not demonstrate pathological findings. And in uh, more advanced uh, disease, osteoarthrosis produces flattening of joint services, uh, subchondral sclerosis, um, osteophyte for formation, which in English is called beaking, like a bird's uh, beak protruding, especially from the anterior surface of uh, the condyle. Uh, panoramic radiographs are pretty good for trauma of a mandible. So if you see a patient with a fracture in mandibular body, always check the contralateral side because an indirect mechanism, a condyle or condylar neck may be fractured. So please remember uh, to survey the whole panoramic very clearly in order not to miss the second fracture. Um, the most common, in fact, tumors of TMJ are amyloblastoma arising in the mandible and then invading uh, the, um, the condyle from the mandibular body and ramus. And this is typical image of amyloblastoma uh, with um, multiple uh, septa 
and um, uh, expansion of uh, mandibular ramus, also the sigmoidal notch is raised um, and the lesion invaded uh, the condyle. It's of course uh, radiolucent. So for computed tomography uh, in uh, the application for uh, TMJ diagnosis, uh, let's um, jump again to uh, the position paper from the American Academy of Oral and Maxofacial uh, Surgery. Already 25 years ago, they scored uh, medical CT very highly, especially in cases of uh, bony lesions, lesions such as ankylosis, um, arthritis, um, and uh, also congenital anomalies, but it's not very good in determining uh, disc position. MRI is much uh, better. Um, as you are aware, there is no cone beam CT in this table. It's because the paper comes, goes back to 1997 and the first uh, machines, CBCT machines, were demonstrated in 1998. So now the role of CBCT is bigger. Since um, medical CT focuses mainly on the imaging of the bone, um, it can be uh, used in congenital malformations, arthropathies, osteoarthritis, trauma, a bone and fracture ankylosis, and of course by combining imaging of bone tissue and soft tissue, it can be used in uh, benign and malignant uh, tumors in order to assess uh, the soft tissue component of the tumor, but also bone destruction and possible uh, calcification in the tumor. And let's have a look at uh, a few examples of use of uh, medical CT. Um, one of them is congenital uh, malformations such as condylar hypoplasia in comparison with a normal left side of the same patient. And um, medical CT is superior to cone beam CT uh, in congenital um, malformations when small children are to be imaged because in cone beam CT in most of the machines the patient must be standing or sitting and in CT the patient uh, lies supine and also a short-term medication can be administered so that the patient is uh, uh, unconscious during the scan then uh, um, reduces the risk of motion artifacts. And of course, you know that small children will not cooperate and will not stand still uh, for the duration of a scan, hence CT is a solution. Um, this is a unilateral hyperplasia of a left condyle, and I was once asked a, a very good question, how to differentiate a hyperplasia from a tumor, because the tumor will also uh, result, benign tumor will also result in increase of dimensions of the condyle, but tumor, the structure of a bone is changed, while in a hyperplasia, the structure of a bone is normal. Osteoarthritis, the signs of um, osteoarthritis are the same uh, in all joints of our organism and TMJ is uh, not, uh, uh, not a different one from them, it's not an exception. And CT can also demonstrate the features such as narrowing of TMJ uh, joint space, beaking, so the osteophyte formation. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, also, uh, there can be erosions on the surface of uh, the condyle, and uh, there may be uh, the cysts, uh, subchondral uh, cysts in the condylar um, uh, bone, the so called Eli's uh, cyst. And um, following trauma or following inflammation also, uh, there can be found ankylosis, uh, which is abnormal um, junction between the, the temporal and mandibular components uh, of TMJ, resulting in loss of mobility in the TMJ. Uh, ankylosis uh, might be due to real bony ankylosis. It can uh, be due to fibrotic 
a connection between uh, the two surfaces, but in some cases you think it's ankylosis uh, because the joint is mobile, one, uh, while in reality, for example, uh, lack of mobility may be due to a tumor infiltrating uh, the muscles, such as uh, pterygoid muscles. Uh, Medical CT is used in TMJ trauma because in many cases patients with polytrauma uh, arrive in the emergency and they get uh, the whole body CT scan from the top of the head to the toes of the um, legs and uh, extremities and then also TMJs are imaged like in this case uh, it's fracture, bilateral fracture of the condylar heads with uh, displacement uh, towards the medial side of the condyles. And of course, uh, reduced mobility in the TMJ. Um, I told you just in the beginning of my lecture that TMJ is affected by intrinsic lesions from the joint space and extrinsic lesions affecting the uh, joint from the outside. And one of these diseases is fibrous dysplasia uh, in which um, the bony trabecular are f thicker and smaller than usual, which results in dense pattern of the bone, the so-called ground glass pattern, or uh, also orange peel pattern. Uh, the outer borders of the bone uh, are usually expanded, and the biggest problem with this disease is, although it's benign, it um, compresses nerve canals, and compression of nerves uh, leads to neurological disorders. Synovial chondromatosis uh, is intrinsic disease of TMJ joint, but of course it's not pathognomonic, so it can be found also in other joints of our organism. And in the course of this uh, disease, you can find multiple areas which look like a sack of pearls. Uh, with um, uh, three loose bodies uh, and in the joint. Uh, first uh, this made is of the first part of the lecture, time, and here uh, you can see with, um, a picture uh, from Poland. This is a place uh, around 45 kilometers uh, from our appearance. city of Lublin. And um, uh, this is in called Kazimierz, and this is the biggest river in Poland, uh, the Prasia River. Condyle, this hey, was now a I will switch very quickly to the second presentation. The of the condyle are still visible but the tumor called, it, uh, caused expansion of a bone around the medial and anterior portion of uh, the skull. TMJ is also location for very malignant tumors for sarcomas uh, of uh, the TMJ, which can be osteosarcoma, synovial sarcoma, and chondrosarcoma. And for uh, sarcomas, uh, we know that the tumors progress very quickly. Uh, they contain soft tissue uh, parts, which is, can be visible in MRI and in medical CT. But they also um, include the so-called pathological calcification and periosteo uh, new bone formation, uh, like spiking uh, or uh, Codman's triangle. Chondroblastoma is a benign tumor. This is a CT and MRI. So in CT, we can perceive um, destruction of the bone, especially the temporal uh, component of the TMJ with uh, multilocular uh, uh, areas uh, of uh, bone destruction. But in MRI, following contrast enhancements, we can appreciate the real size of soft tissue tumor that uh, resulted in resorption of the bone. Um, medical CT can be used also for planning of um, surgeries and in this case it was uh, used for planning of complete replacement with a prosthesis and TMJ uh, prosthesis as well. For CBCT uh, we can use it in many cases uh, instead of medical CT as it's uh, much more available in dental practices and uh, also um, exposes patients to lower radiation doses. 
uh, for um, TMJ examinations for functional assessment of TMJ. Uh, the patient may come with a silicone index uh, so that the position of um, the, the teeth uh, in occlusion is uh, standardized according to uh, the needs of a referring a doctor. And if you ask uh, me uh, whether this uh, silicone index uh, would disturb my evaluation, of course it wouldn't uh, because it does not interfere with uh, the images of teeth. And also the, radio, the image must be taken with mouth closed. So you can see some overlap of upper and lower teeth. But this uh, is not a problem either as we can uh, evaluate the crown separately and for example axial slices and moreover remember Remember, at this moment, cone beam CT is still not considered a good tool for imaging of a dental caries. So we tend to obtain a TMJ views in closed mouth position without the bite pack or we can do it with a splint in therapeutic position. We classify uh, the shape of a TMJ cone dial as flat round, um, angulated, uh, convex, and with some um, erosions. And uh, it has been proved that the flattened, eroded, and angulated um, condyle shapes and coronal scans correspond more often uh, to osteoarthritis. And uh, I would like to show you a few images uh, that uh, come from a book which will be published in March this year. This is uh, Atlas of Cone Beam Computed Tomography prepared in international cooperation. And this is a case of unilateral condylar hyperplasia, so in this panoramic uh, view, it's uh, very similar to what you have seen uh, in panoramic radiograph with one condyle one much bigger than the other one. Then uh, we've got the opposite, which is uh, hypoplasia of TMJ in a patient, young female patients with treacher collins syndrome. Uh, the TMJ is almost non-existent with uh, flat uh, articular eminence, uh, very small condyle, very mm, uh, shallow sigmoidal uh, notch. Um, this is a case of juvenile arthritis and uh, the, there is destruction of both condyles. This is not coronal image, this is sagittal uh, image and uh, the, the articular eminence is uh, in a way stuck uh, in this concave um, destroyed uh, condyle in this teenage uh, patient. And three years uh, later um, there was um, and uh, the CBCT was uh, retaken. In this case, it was taken with mouth open. And it's quite surprising that the patient still had mouth opening, although uh, the image of condyles uh, is still the same. So uh, the, the articular eminence looks like uh, stuck uh, in the middle of this concave. Um, uh, for uh, trauma of TMJ, this is a case of uh, left side fracture of a condyle with displacement uh, towards the medial portion. And um, our CBCT always also allows us to obtain images after untreated uh, trauma to uh, compare the normal and the pathologically changed um, site. And of course, these patients are much more prone to early osteoarthritis. And um, this is a patient uh, post fixation of uh, bilateral uh, fractures of a condyle with a CBCT follow up. Uh, fractures of a coronoid process are infrequent. I think I have seen twice uh, something like that in my life, including one in panoramic and one in cone beam CT. Uh, for luxation, we do not. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we do not take the cone beam CT with mouth open too frequently. I prefer uh, the radiographs I showed you in the beginning, the ones in panoramic machine with mouth closed and open for this purpose, but sometimes uh, we do get referrals like that. And the condyle 
uh, far beyond the articular uh, eminences bilaterally in this per, uh, patient, the glenoid fossa, empty in open mouth uh, position. Just like uh, in uh, um, CT, uh, CBCT also has allows us to observe osteoarthritis, in this case, left hand side um, sclerosis, uh, then a sclerosis of a coronoid process, angulation of a condyle with an erosion on the upper surface of a condyle, um, elicist narrowing of um, the joint space, flattening of uh, the condylar heads, beaking, small beaking, and uh, large degeneration with large osteophytes in this uh, patients. Just like with panoramic radiography, we can also observe amyloblastoma, but CBCT also allows us uh, to um, evaluate uh, the buccolingual uh, extension and ex um, um, uh, extension of the bone. Um, a case of chondromatosis, multiple calcified uh, areas around the TMJ, and the same patient after uh, surgery uh, with uh, just a few remnants left around the TMJ. Not all the loose bodies were. Uh, and so it was a case of uh, metastasis from breast carcinoma to the right condyle, uh, which caused uh, destruction of the condyle. The condyle, condylar head is almost erased, and the condylar neck and part of uh, the ramus of a mandible is also infiltrated. And so this is follow up after resection of a, a mandible uh, with fixation with osteosynthetic plates and a reconstruction uh, with a transplantation uh, from the uh, fibula. Um, for the few, uh, sorry, very few uh, centers in Europe perform fluoroscopy. Sweden uh, from uh, Eva Levering uh, Jakhagen and Professor Jan Alkvist, who is already um, this year, last year he retired. Uh, for fluoroscopy, you need a fluoroscopic unit with a C arm. Uh, there is an X ray tube underneath the patient table and uh, image intensifier. Above the patient, the C arm allows movements of the tube around uh, the patient's head. This is what you need in order to perform uh, arthrography. And please remember that this is um, interventional technique, which is, uh, um, uh, this interferes uh, with a TMJ because you must place a catheter inside uh, the TMJ space and administer contrast media. Um, still, there are some indications for uh, arthrography, and after administration of contrast media, uh, upper and lower joint spaces are filled with contrast media, and the area between uh, the two contrast spaces is the TMJ disc itself. Um, arthrography allows for a dynamic evaluation of TMJ in the closed and open mouth position, uh, so the filling defect between the contrast medium is the disc, so in this case it was normal. And this is disc displacement, so the disc is in front of a condyle both enclosed and open mouth position, so this is without reduction. Um, the arthrography can also be useful in uh, cases of perforation of TMJ disc and of its posterior attachment, which might not be visible in other imaging studies. So the leakage of contrast media uh, to the joint space testifies to the area of perforation. So 25 years ago, arthrography was not very highly scored by the Americans. But um, my colleagues uh, say that there are still indications for 
TMJ fluoroscopy, for example, in patients who due to contraindications uh, cannot have MRI scan performed with just TMJ disc or posterior attachment. Uh, when adhesions in TMJ joint space are present, it also allows real-time dynamic functional evaluation. So we ask the patient to open, close, open, close, and we'll watch it, let's say, live under fluoroscopy. Um, it's also uh, used as a control for some uh, minor procedures, such as injections, uh, in order to lose adherences uh, within the uh, joints. And so contraindications, just like in case of uh, sialography, also every process in the joint space, around the joint space. It's also previous side effects reported when patients um, had uh, examinations performed with iodine-based contrast media, bleeding disorders, or chronic taking of anti anti uh, medications. And as with every X-ray. Uh, radiograph, lack of patient cooperation. For ultrasounds, uh, we can do that with mouth open, mouth closed. Um, the, the Americans scored with only zeros 25 years ago. I would not be that severe, um, especially for the presence of joint effusion, but I'm not a very big fan of uh, TMJ ultrasound just for TMJ disc position. I'm a very big fan of uh, ultrasound for imaging of tumors around the, the joint for um, muscles, masticatory muscles um, uh, evaluation, uh, but uh, also for uh, TMJ guidance for biopsy or uh, corticosteroid injection. To the joints. So in ultrasound in normal TMJ you can't see too much because um, of um, post-acoustic shadowing created by cortical plates in the TMJ. Uh, we've got um, TMJ space visible. If uh, it's osteoarthritis it can be narrowed. If there is uh, effusion in the joint it can be enlarged. So this is a, a case of osteoarthrosis on even surfaces of the joint uh, space. And as mentioned, uh, ultrasound is really good for the muscles of mastications, especially masseter muscle, the temporalis muscle, and uh, if you have got an intraoral probe, also for pterygoid muscles. And last but definitely not least, uh, TMJ in evaluation of um, temporomandibular joint. This is the best imaging modality for uh, temporomandibular joint disc displacement. As um, in this slide, you can see the correlation between anatomical preparation and uh, MRI image, so the anatomy is really very well depicted with TMJ disc um, as biconcave in normal cases with posterior uh, attachment, the bilaminar zone, the condyle, and the articular eminence, the glenoid uh, fossa. Uh, we assess uh, TMJ in sagittal uh, slices, but also in coronal slices because uh, displacement of TMJ disc are not purely management, this displacement, osteoarthritis. Um, what is um, the normal disc position? In closed mouth position, the posterior bend of the disc is located over the candular, condylar head, and in open mouth position, the condylar head is located between the anterior and posterior bends of a TMJ disc, and coronal plane, there is no asymmetry. So biconcave disc in closed mouth position and biconcave disc in open mouth position. And in fact, this is uh, the row of a disc because this is a kind of a cushion between uh, the two bony surfaces of a condylar head and the glenoid fossa articular eminence. This is coronal image. Uh, the disc on top of a, a condyle without asymmetry. So this is normal. And in uh, disc displacement with reduction, 
in open mouth position, the disc is dislocated in front of a condyle. This, this is condyle. This is posterior bend of a disc, and uh, that's why the patients suffer uh, with pain from TMJ displacement because this uh, area is uh, very high in uh, neural uh, endings, uh, so compression will cause considerable pain. And in reduction, so in mouth opening, the disc will pop up on the top of a condylar uh, head to its normal position. For disc displacement without reduction, the disc will be in abnormal position. So in this case, anterior, but also lateral, medial, very rarely posterior to the condyle, mandibular uh, condyle. This is a case from uh, literature. Uh, I told you that posterior disc displacement is uh, very rare. It uh, occurs especially in the cases of severe trauma. Uh, but in this case, there was anterior displacement of the left side and posterior displacement on the right side. And some disc displacements may occur in conjunction with uh, fluid collections. This is MRI, a T2 image hyperintense, a T1 image uh, hypointense. Uh, disc displacements uh, can uh, be observed together with osteoarthritis or without osteoarthritis. But if you've got uh, os advanced osteoarthritis like this beaking, and uh, sclerosis of a condyle, it's very rare that uh, the disc would be completely uh, normal. So you can have cases of osteoarthritis with normal disc position, but uh, uh, this is like exceptional. So the normal disc on top of the condyle, but the condyle is abnormally sclerotic in this MRI uh, image. So once again, sclerosis of the condyle, but the disc is pretty normal. But this is definitely less frequent then the osteoarthritis and osteoarthrosis. MRI can be used um, to demonstrate high-grade inflammation such as rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile arthritis, psoriatic uh, arthritis. So uh, there is a com combination of disc displacement. Uh, the shape of the disc is also changed, flattening of the condyle, beaking, and uh, uh, sclerosis. For the evaluation of the status of the bone in MRI, we take a look at the bone marrow. Normal is homogeneous with high signal and proton density PD images and intermediate signal in T2 weighted images. And in case of uh, sclerosis, some part of bone marrow will not just be visible, and this is how we diagnose bone disease in MRI. In this case, the condyle is filled with normal uh, bone uh, marrow. And for bone marrow edema, uh, there is fluid collection in the bone uh, uh, marrow. So uh, you, you must uh, be familiar with um, basic principles of MRI. So fluid has high signal intensity in T2-weighted images and low uh, signal intensity in T1-weighted images. Uh, so this is how we differentiate edema uh, from normal bone marrow. And in this case, uh, we also can observe displacement of TMJ disc in closed mouth position with a changed shape of the disc. And um, for other uh, diseases, uh, that's also bone marrow edema, high signal in T2, the disc is displaced and folded uh, in the anterior uh, position. Um, disc um, uh, bone marrow necrosis and sclerosis look uh, very much alike because uh, sclerotic bone does not contain too many protons producing signal in MRI, so it's high intensity, uh, low intensity. And in this case, also TMJ disc, it's uh, um, not biconcave, it's concave only unilaterally, and it's displaced anteriorly. 
And um, there was a good study um, correlating the shapes of uh, TMJ disks, which is normal uh, biconcave, flattened, then uh, partly uh, concave only on one side, like U-shaped, and then folded with uh, um, disk displacement. So it seems that uh, biconcave and biplanar uh, disks more often correlated with normal disk position and anterior disk displacement without reduction was found with discs which were folded and thickening of the posterior part so highly uh, changed. And a quick look at other diseases um, that we have already discussed. Let's have a look if MRI can uh, help us in differentiation this disease. So for ankylosing, uh, spondylitis, there is uh, condylar erosion. You can see the layer of uh, sclerotic bone here. Uh, there is contrast enhancement of um, the joint space in T1-weighted imaging, and there is also bony edema, bone mineral edema, high signal intensity in T2, the most striking findings. Um, Arthritis can occur also following trauma, and um, in this patient, uh, we can see large fluid collections in the joint spaces after uh, traumatic accidents. Uh, synovial sarcoma is not common, so once again, uh, I'm presenting a case from uh, literature of a large tumor. This is MRI, uh, this is medical uh, CT. And um, yes, and uh, that's all I prepared for you. And once again, I would like to welcome you very uh, warm-heartedly to the um, Lublin, uh, the city in southeastern Poland. And um, this is the main square in our city, the Lithuanian square, where you can see the colorful fountains. And during the summertime, also some uh, video shows are presented in the fountains. So you are well, most welcome to join the Erasmus Plus program and come to Lublin as our uh, students. Thank you for your attention.